that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> well, as folks are making their way back in, let's uh, take our Bibles and open them to the book of Romans. Book of Romans, chapter 11 and verse 15. This uh, particular session is on the kingdom. I had a chance to teach on Israel and the covenants earlier, and now we're dealing with the kingdom. So I have 45 minutes to explain what's going to happen during a thousand year kingdom. (laughs) So obviously this is going to be the Reader's Digest version. If you want the big picture, I I did write a 400-page book that's available at our book table called The Coming Kingdom. The book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 15, Paul the Apostle says, For if there, Israel's, rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? You know, one of the greatest uh, tragedies in all of history is first century Israel's rejection of their king, uh, Jesus, Yeshua. But it's sort of interesting how God took lemons and turned it into lemonade. Because as Israel turned Jesus over to Rome for execution, the Lord fastened onto that transaction the sin debt of the whole world. And so all of us are saved because of what happened 2,000 years ago when we trust in the Messiah. So if God can take a tragic situation and turn it into a triumph, just think what he's going to do once the nation of Israel doesn't reject their king but receives him. Paul says it's going to be like life back from the dead. And this is where the Old Testament prophets are so important to us and helpful because 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 tells us that the prophets function as a lamp shining in a dark place. Would you say our world is in a dark place? What gives us hope in the midst of it is a lamp shining in a dark place until the morning star arises. And the day dawns. In other words, the prophets sketch out for us what the coming kingdom is going to look like one day when the nation of Israel receives her Messiah. And if we didn't have this light functioning in a dark place or shining in a dark place, we wouldn't have hope in this age. So what's the kingdom going to look like? I'm going to talk really fast through 14 characteristics of the kingdom. Are you ready for this? Number one, when the kingdom comes, it will be established by God. Daniel 2 verse 44 says, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. It will be that stone cut without human hands that shatters the Antichrist empire, causing that whole statue there in Daniel 2 to deteriorate instantly. And that stone cut without human hands will grow and grow and grow till it fills the earth. And once the kingdom comes, it's not going to be dependent on the electoral college. It's not going to be dependent on the polls. God is going to bring it. And it will be established by God. And you won't be able to vote it out of office if you don't like it. The second reality of the kingdom is when it comes, it's going to be eternal. It's going to last forever. Daniel 7 and verse 27 says, His kingdom will be like an everlasting kingdom. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, hold the phone now. I thought the kingdom is going to last a thousand years. And it is. But the thousand years is just the front porch. The front porch. The house will be the eternal state. So that thousand year kingdom is going to merge into the eternal state and it will last forever. 
The third uh, reality of this coming kingdom is once it comes, it will represent the direct rule of God on planet Earth. Uh, what was lost in Eden is going to be restored. So what was happening in Eden was God was ruling over a man, the first Adam, and he, alongside of his wife Eve, were governing creation for God. There's a fancy name for that. We call that the office of theocratic administrator. And in Genesis chapter 3, that got lost. Man and woman, they started to listen to the animals. One in particular, a talking snake. And they, in the process, rebelled against God. And ever since that point in time, Satan is now the prince and power of the air. He's ruling this world. But when the kingdom is established, that structure that we saw in Eden will come right back to the earth. This time, God the Father will not be ruling over the first Adam, but the who? The last Adam, Jesus Christ. And he will be governing creation on God the Father's behalf. And he's going to be right there with his wife as Adam was there with his wife at the beginning. Now, who would his wife be? That would be us, the church. We're ruling and reigning alongside Jesus Christ throughout the ages. So one of the things to understand is we are destined for authority as God's people. Everything that's happening in your life is preparing you for that authority. Just like everything that happened in Joseph's life between age 17 and age 30 was preparing him for the time when he would be second in command over all of Egypt, everything is preparing you for that period of time. As someone has said, it's, this life is nothing more than training time for reigning time. Zechariah chapter 9 and uh, verse 10 of this time period says his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. There's a third characteristic of this coming kingdom, excuse me, a fourth characteristic, that's number four, it will be earthly. We're not dealing with something up in the clouds somewhere. A lot of people have this idea of the afterlife as we're kind of wearing these white sheets like angels and we're up in the clouds and we're strumming harps and we're singing the hallelujah chorus 10,000 times, getting bored with the repetition. The reality of the situation is we are with the Lord in the Father's house following the rapture for a mere seven years. And then we're re returning with him to the earth to rule and to reign. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 of our future role basically says he has made us to be a kingdom of priests and we will reign with him on the earth. This is an earthly kingdom. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9 of the kingdom says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. It's the time in history where Jesus reclaims victory over this planet and reclaims what was lost in Eden. So hopefully as we go through these, you're getting a clear picture in your mind of what a restored Israel is going to look like one day, the blessings that will come to the earth. Number five, the kingdom will represent the realization of the land promises. Over in Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, the Lord promised the patriarch Abram a track of real estate stretching all the way from modern-day Egypt to modern-day Iraq. It's that lighter blue area there that you see on the screen. That darker blue area is, is just a sliver of what Israel currently possesses. She just possesses a mere sliver of everything that she will have once the kingdom materializes. And we are waiting for the millennial kingdom for this to happen. Ezekiel chapter 47 is a really interesting chapter. It talks about the land division amongst the 12 tribes. 
You know, when Joshua conquered the land in the book of Joshua, the second half of the book of Joshua, really beginning around chapter 13 through the end of the book, is a description of the apportionment of the land amongst the 12 tribes. And when you study Ezekiel chapter 47, what you learn is there's going to be apportionment of the land again. The dimensions are a little bit different. But just as the land was apportioned amongst the tribes in the days of Joshua, according to Ezekiel chapter 47, the same thing is going to happen in the millennial kingdom. This is why Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, that have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne and you shall also sit upon the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is all very earthly. It's all very terrestrial. And this is what the coming kingdom will look like. There's a sixth characteristic of the coming kingdom, and it's going to deal with the nation of Israel in a place of elevation over the other nations. A lot of people say, well, I believe uh, in a future for Israel, and that's not a correct representation. We don't believe in a future for Israel. We believe Israel is the future. And she is actually going to be elevated to a place of prominence and preeminence in the millennial kingdom. Today she's just sort of kicked around, looked at by the world community as if she's in the way of progress. But once the millennial kingdom materializes, Israel will become preeminent. Notice Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. It says, now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 23 is even more specific about the nations in the millennial kingdom. It says, of these nations, they will bow down to you, that's the nation of Israel, with their faces to the earth and lick the dust off your feet, the Jewish people. That passage is in my Bible. I I have hardly heard a pastor in the church age talk about that. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23 says, In those days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And if anybody understands this, it's the devil himself. Because when Satan is let loose out of his abyss at the end of the thousand years, he immediately attacks the beloved city. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, it talks about a great rebellion that Satan will lead at the end of the millennial kingdom. It says there, And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. What beloved city would that be? That would be the city of Jerusalem. Why does Satan attack Jerusalem at the end of the millennial kingdom when he comes out of the abyss? The answer is Satan himself understands where the nerve center of the millennial kingdom is. Where the headquarters of the millennial kingdom is. It's the city of Jerusalem. Robert Thomas correctly says at the end of the millennium that city, Jerusalem, will be Satan's prime objective with his rebel army because Israel will be leader again among the nations. What else is going to happen during the millennial kingdom? Well, there's going to be a millennial temple. A brick and mortar temple. You see it described with tremendous vivid detail in the book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, Ezekiel gives us the dimensions of that temple, and notice the size of the temple. Notice how big it compares to Herod's temple. 
that was on the earth when Jesus ministered. Notice the size of the millennial temple in comparison to the tabernacle. Notice the size of the temple in comparison to the Solomonic temple, which was an awesome sight to behold. Notice how the millennial temple compares to a football field. I mean, if language means anything and God means what he says and says what he means and he does, this temple is going to be enormous. And so this is something that we are looking forward to during the millennial kingdom. Now, a lot of questions come up. Well, is this talking about the eternal state? Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, talks about the thousand-year kingdom. Revelation 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the Bible, talks about the eternal state. And a lot of people just sort of blend these areas of Scripture together, but you can't do that. And this chart here shows you all of the differences between the millennial kingdom and the eternal state. But there's one major difference that I'll draw to your attention the millennial kingdom will be or will involve a temple, a brick and mortar temple. Now, that can't be talking about the eternal state because in the eternal state, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, it says, I saw no temple in it. So what do you do with Ezekiel 40 through 48? You can either make it the church and allegorize it out of existence or a lot of people try to get rid of it by putting it into the eternal state, but that doesn't work because in the eternal state there's no temple because Jesus is the one that provides the glory. The only place the millennial temple really fits is in that intermediate time period in between the second coming of Christ and the eternal state, that thousand year kingdom, which is sort of the front porch, if you will, of the coming kingdom. And you can do this exercise with many, many prophecies in the Bible. There are many prophecies that don't fit today. They don't fit the eternal state. So where do you put them? The only place they really would fit is during this 1,000-year kingdom. And so if you were to jettison the teaching of the 1,000-year kingdom from your Bible, you have a lot of passages of the Bible that have no logical place for their fulfillment. This is one example. So the millennial kingdom is just going to be a wonderful time period with this functioning millennial temple. Now here's something else, number eight. The millennial kingdom will be a time period when David will be resurrected from the dead and he will rule and reign over the land of Israel. In fact, his physical presence will be so real, you will actually be able to go up to him and shake his hand. And you won't even have to give a campaign contribution <laughs> for the privilege. And there are four passages that talk about David's resurrection in the millennial kingdom. Here's one. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 9, it says, But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's, you can't make that the literal David. That's just sort of a type, if you will, of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. The problem is, when David is used of a type of Jesus Christ in the Bible, there's a textual clue alerting you to that fact. It'll say something like, root of Jesse, branch of David, son of David, seed of David. You'll notice that Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 9 says no such thing. It just says David. So what I foresee happening is David is resurrected. And by the way, why can't David be resurrected? All of the Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs are going to be resurrected. Revelation 20 verses 4 and 5. Daniel 12, verse 2, they're going to be resurrected at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. David would be in that group. And David will be elevated to a position of authority over the whole land of Israel. And yet, Jesus, Yeshua, is going to be reigning over the whole earth. And so it's sort of like a delegated co-regency 
form of authority. David is ruling the land of Israel under the authority of Jesus Christ, who's ruling all of planet Earth. And it's very uh, exciting to me to see that David is going to be put in that role, given all of the problems David had in his life. Not the least of which is murder and adultery. Not in that order, first adultery, then murder. And one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, where it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I love that. Because in the first half of the book, Jonah is rebellious. And God put Jonah into time out, I guess we could say. (laughs) And when that process was finished, God restored Jonah to his ministry. God is doing the same thing with David in the millennial kingdom under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so if there's some kind of Uh, issue in your life where you think you're disqualified from being used by God, think again, God is a God of grace. So there's going to be this millennial David. Now here's the part of the millennial kingdom I'm really looking forward to, besides all of these other things. Number nine, it's a time period of righteousness. No graft, no corruption, No magical ballots appearing at 2 (laughs) a.m. And I probably just got myself canceled right there by saying that. (laughs) But it says there, and this is in all your Christmas cards, by the way. It says, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and the government will rest on his shoulders, Isaiah 9, verse 6, of Jesus, and it says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and what? Forevermore. It's a righteous kingdom. No bribery, no, no graft, no kickbacks. It's righteousness. A couple things that will make it righteous. Number one, it will be righteous because the knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 9 says, For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So heartening to read that in a climate like we're living in today where we can't even get the Bible taught in most schools. And let's be honest with ourselves, we're having a difficult time keeping the Bible in most churches. And yet there's coming this time period where the knowledge of God is going to be unrestricted. And that's one of the things that makes this kingdom righteous. Something else that makes it righteous is people won't be stepping out of line because Jesus will be ruling with a rod of iron. The age of grace will largely be over. And if people step out of line, there's instantaneous justice Psalm uh, chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8 talks about this. And it says, I will give, I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. And then verse 9 says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. The book of Revelation chapter 12. And verse 5 says, And she, that's Israel, gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. So you're dealing with a time period of complete and total justice. In fact, the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, talks about certain people groups that will not want to go to Jerusalem to worship the king on the Feast of Booths. And the Lord doesn't tolerate that for very long because there's immediate justice. They don't receive the proper moisture that they need for their crops because Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. It's not like today where there can be a long delay between sin and justice. That won't exist in the millennial kingdom. 
The only reason there's a time gap today between sin and divine justice many times is something called grace. And we thank God for that. But once we get into the millennial kingdom and the age of the kingdom begins, that age of grace is over. There's instantaneous and immediate justice and immediate judgment. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4 of that time period says, He, that's Jesus, will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. These are all portraits of this coming kingdom. People today are talking a lot about social justice. Well, you're going to get your social justice, believe me, when Jesus reigns over planet earth from David's throne. It says there he will reign in Zion from Jerusalem. During that time period he will judge between the nations and render decisions for many peoples. Something else is going to happen during the millennial kingdom, this takes us to number 10, is the curse is going to be curtailed. It won't be completely eliminated like it will during the eternal state, but it's going to be dramatically rolled back. Original sin affected all of creation. Romans chapter 8 verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The whole creation is in a state of travail. The whole creation is in a state of groaning because of Adam's sin. These verses go on and say we are actually eagerly waiting the redemption of our bodies. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> the very physical body that you're in is decaying. Now you say, well, I don't believe you. And here's how you can prove it's true. Take out your modern day driver's license and take out your high school yearbook picture. <laughs> put them side by side. So once the millennial kingdom comes, this terrible curse that has been imposed on creation is going to be not eliminated, but it's going to be rolled back because currently our world is in a state of bondage to original sin. But look what Jesus does when he returns and establishes his kingdom. It says in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6, and wolf will dwell with the lamb. Now the last time I was at the Houston Zoo, they were in separate cages, I noticed. It goes on and it says the lion will eat straw like the ox. In other words, animals become herbivorous again rather than carnivorous. It says the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the copra, on the viper's den and not be harmed. Well, there's old, you know, grandson in the back goofing around with the viper again, putting his hand down the <laughs> viper's nest. And it's just, you just don't sweat it because in the millennium, there's peace within the animal kingdom and there's peace between human beings and animals. All of these were the repercussions of sin, this violence between the animals and animals and people, but all of this is rolled back in the millennial kingdom. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 20 says, For the youth will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. So a hundred year old dies and everybody kind of sits around and says, wow, that's tragic that such a young man died. <laughs> um, it, it's sort of like it will be like it was in the days of Noah prior to the flood when I believe there was a protective canopy around the earth which sort of filtered the sun's harmful rays which allowed people to live much, much longer than they live today. Adam lived to the ripe old age of 930. 
Methuselah, the oldest living man, lived until 969 years of age. In fact, this passage goes on, Isaiah 65, verse 22, and says, For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. Just like a tree survives through multiple generations, so will the lifetime of a person be expanded into multiple generations. They'll, they'll wear out the works of their hands. You, you buy a new house, you build a house, and then the house deteriorates before you do because you're living so long. So you say, I've got to fix up my house. Uh, that's the kind of situation that the prophets predict here. Now, notice that in the millennial kingdom, there's still death because it does say if someone dies at the age of 100, they're going to be thought accursed. So death exists, but death is largely a thing of the past. That, by the way, is why there has to be animal sacrifices in the millennial temple. People get very upset about that. But the truth of the matter is, in a world where death is sort of something of a bygone memory you would have a tendency to forget about the death of Jesus who got you into the millennial kingdom to begin with. And so you walk into the millennial temple and we've described it and you see animals being slaughtered and suddenly you remember, oh yeah, that's what death is like. And if that's what death is like, I'm sure grateful for Jesus' death which got me into the millennial kingdom. So the animal sacrifices really are not there to supplement the finished work of Jesus. Nothing ever could, but they're there as a memorial device to get us to reflect backward to what Jesus did. It's the same reason the Lord commanded the church to partake of the Lord's table regularly. The bread would represent his body, which was sacrificed in our place the cup would represent his blood which was spilled on our behalf and in an age of grace where we're so accustomed to grace we typically forget that the price that was paid to give us this grace and so when we partake of the Lord's table together we're reminded by way of a memorial of the death of Jesus that is largely how the animal sacrifices will function in their purpose during the millennial kingdom and you can see that's very significant because you're living in a world where people almost don't know what death is anymore but you'll notice that this has to be a millennial passage it can't be an eternal state passage because in the eternal state there's no more what there's no more death so you have many many passages and prophecies and verses like this which can't be fulfilled today they can't be fulfilled in the eternal state where are you going to put them that's why that thousand year intermediate time period is so significant the millennial kingdom is also going to be a time of peace not just peace in the heart but peace amongst the nations Isaiah 2 and verse 3 says they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn of war. Look how much money the nations can save not having to finance armaments and armies anymore. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9 says they will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 65 and verse 25 says, they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain. It's a time period of political peace. War is just sort of a curious game that people used to play. Obviously that's not happening today because that little red dot there represents Israel. That green air, those green areas, those are Islamic countries. So in no way, shape, or form is Israel experiencing the political peace that the prophets anticipate. This must be speaking of the coming kingdom. By the way, the world community, you know what it says in its wisdom? Well, if Israel just gave up a little bit more territory, <laughs> we would have world peace. 
Very sadly, these passages that I'm reading here from Isaiah, etc., about the kingdom, they're inscribed onto United Nations property. When the United Nations takes those verses and inscribes them onto their property, and by the way, we're all the people saying you can't bring religion into the public square when the United Nations does this. The silence is deafening. But when the United Nations takes these passages from Isaiah and inscribes them onto their property, the United Nations is basically saying, we are going to bring in world peace. So they've taken upon their own shoulders a job that only the Messiah can do. And if that's the standard, the United Nations is a, is a terrible failure because there have been more wars subsequent to the formation of the United Nations than before. No, the United Nations will not bring in these circumstances. Only a restored Israel and Yeshua reigning over Israel and then over the whole earth will bring these prophecies into existence. The millennial kingdom is also going to be a time of unstoppable prosperity. Isaiah chapter 65 verses 21 and 22 says they will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now look at this. They will not build and another inhabit. The doctrine of socialism and Marxism, essentially what it says is, you work, I eat. Well, gee, don't you believe in a safety net? Well, the problem is when the safety net turns into a hammock, then we have a problem. And so we have a whole sort of economic mindset where people want to redistribute the wealth from the earner to the non-earner. You'll notice that in the millennial kingdom, such a thing will not be a reality. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. Prosperity. True social justice. What you earn, you keep. Amos chapter 9 verse 13 talks about this unstoppable prosperity. It says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. In other words, the person planting the seed, they're overshadowed by the crop that's coming up so fast. When the mountains will drip sweet wine and the hills will be um, dissolved. You know, and you look at our world today with all of its economic problems, layoffs, uh, inflation, all of these things everybody's worried about. Think about a time period when economic prosperity is just a foregone reality for a thousand years. There's also going to be tremendous changes in the topography of the earth. This takes us to number 13. For example, there's going to be abundant rainfall. Boy, as Texans, we can appreciate that. Psalm, excuse me, Ezekiel 34, 26 says, I will cause showers to come down in their season. There will be showers of blessing. There's going to be water in the wilderness. Water is going to break out in areas where people didn't know water was there. Um, Isaiah chapter 35 verse 6 says, For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become like a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. There's something else that's going to happen. I find this very interesting. The Dead Sea is going to come to life. Why do we call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Well, everything in the sea is dead because of the high salt content and so when you travel to the land of Israel you can actually float in the Dead Sea it pushes you right up there's I, I thought I'd be the first person to sink but there I am <laughs> happily floating along and then I looked on the shore and I saw that there were lifeguards <laughs> and I thought what do these guys do no one no one can drown so in my retirement years, I've got my application already for applying for a lifeguard on the Dead Sea. Just read the paper, and it's just a great thing. 
But the interesting thing is when you study Ezekiel 47, what it talks about is there's going to be a, a river that's going to flow out of the Millennial Temple that we've spoken of earlier. It's going to flow into the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is going to teem once again with biological life. And get your suntan lotion ready because the sun is going to be seven times brighter than what it is. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 26 says the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter. Now that can't be the eternal state because there's no sun, S-U-N, in the eternal state because who is illuminating the eternal state? The sun, the S-O-N, sun. These are passages that only fit the millennial kingdom. There's not going to be any struggling anymore with physical healing either. Isaiah chapter 35 and verses 5 and 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the moot will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. That's one of the most difficult things that you go through as a Christian when something in someone else's body or your body doesn't work right and you pray for healing and the healing never comes. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Paul the Apostle suffered from some kind of thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was. There's a lot of conjecture, but it was something that hurt. And he pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. This, this thorn, whatever it was, perhaps a bodily illness. Paul talks about bodily illnesses in the book of Galatians. Perhaps it was something that kept him in a place of dependence upon God. And so we struggle with this issue of sickness, healing, how different the millennial kingdom is going to be, where there won't be any deficiencies in terms of one's health. And then finally, number 14, and with this we'll conclude, there's going to be immediate answers to prayer. What a struggle prayer can be, because the book of James tells us that sometimes we ask amiss. If we ask according to his will, he hears us. And sometimes we don't know exactly what the will of God is for a certain circumstance. And we pray and we don't get an answer. And we think, well, I guess the prayer must have been outside of God's will. Or maybe God is going to answer it later. How, how different the millennial kingdom will be. Because it says in Isaiah 65 verse 24, before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear instantaneous, immediate answers to prayer. So are you looking forward to this? Yes. Yeah. Established by God, eternal, the direct rule of Jesus Christ, earthly, land promises fulfilled, Israel preeminent, functioning millennial temple with animal sacrifices, a millennial David, righteousness, curse curtailed, peace all over the earth, prosperity, Topographical changes, immediate answers to prayer. And it's no wonder then that when our Lord taught the disciples to pray in the so-called Lord's Prayer, which really isn't the Lord's Prayer, it's the disciples' prayer, he was teaching them how to pray. I hope it wasn't the Lord's Prayer because he says, forgive us our debts and sins. I think Jesus was sinless. Amen? Amen. But part of that prayer, how does it begin? Thy kingdom what? Come. Why would we pray for this kingdom to come? Why would we pray for Israel to be restored to Yeshua so the kingdom can come? So all of these blessings will come to planet earth. If Israel's rejection of her own Messiah brought us the good news of the gospel... What more is God going to do when Israel is back in the fold? This kingdom will come to the earth. And so we pray thy kingdom. These, these, these prophecies, they, as Second Peter says, they function as a lamp shining in a dark place. The world is in a very dark place. 
and what gives us hope are the, are the pages of Bible prophecy. Without the pages of Bible prophecy, we would have no hope because we would see this world as continuing on in its current state and how different the vantage point of the believer is. And it looks like I'm out of time because we're about to hear a sound. You ready? Go. All right. <laughs> That's what happens when the speakers go over. They, they get a beep. And if that doesn't work, we've wired a trap door here. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word, grateful for the things that we're learning at this conference. Thank you, Lord, for all of these gifted servants sharing their expertise with us. And I just pray you'll continue to help us to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. If you can come back at 3.30, we would appreciate it.